All right. So I'm Jared Shumway again. And <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, so I really like tools. I didn't realize how much I like tools until I accepted a, like internal tools internship and then started thinking about it and realized that I actually spend a lot of my development time making tools um, mostly to help me like score board games or generate random stuff for board games because I'm lazy, but other forms as well. Uh, and a lot of my favorite technologies are like also tools, like compilers, just do a lot of work for you. Uh, so, there we go. Okay, so in this talk, uh, my goals are to A, convince you that tools are really awesome and can make you a way better person and developer. Um, provide some example tools and some like workflows that you could use on your class projects to make them way easier, go faster, have less bugs the first time you compile them. Um, and convince you to learn more about tools. I can't really, I'm gonna go over like four or five tools here. I can't tell you all the details about how all, the, or how they work, about all the like different ways you could apply them. So I really just want to encourage you to go and spend some time learning about tools. Uh, and so tell me if this seems familiar. Uh, you have your build command to run GCC, then you run your program do some development, and sometime later when you need to rebuild your project, it's up, 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 and then you miss it by one, go down, and then hit net enter, and that's how you get back to your GCC command line, right? Like, thank you, Jesse. Uh, this is really common. This is what I did for a long time, and this is, there's some problems here. I think we can all agree. This is really error prone if you uh, change your um, build script or your just a little build line, and then you are just spamming up. You, I mean, I always go to the wrong one. I always misclick and rerun my old program instead of rerunning the build line. It takes a lot of time. It's annoying. So one tool that I really like is called Make that you can use to not do this. Um, also, <laughs> Make. So Make is a system that uh, evaluates a series of rules, these dependency rules, that just so happens to be usable as a build system. And if you don't get that joke, you will when you learn Make. Um, and so all the rules in a make file uh, have this form. There's a target, separate, and then separated by colon. There's other targets that are the dependency of that target, and then rules for how to rebuild that target. So a really simple example, you have this program called greet. It takes two source code files, and then if either of those source code files have changed, then the target greet is considered out of date and will be rebuilt using this GCC invocation. Right, um, so it's great. Like, if you guys don't use make, just do this. Just make one rule and just put the um, GCC command that you're constantly up arrowing to into the file, and that's already way, way better um, because then all you have to do to rebuild your project is type make. Um, but make is a lot more powerful than that. You can have these rules depend on each other. Um, so C, if you aren't aware yet, has these things called object files that are this intermediate stage as part of the build process. Um, and so you know, if you only change one file in your project and you have you know, 20 files, you only need to rebuild one of those and then relink them, which can really cut down on the time it takes to build your project. Um, and the way you can ex like, get the benefit out of that is make using incremental builds. So you can see in red, I highlighted one of the um, targets for the greet binary is hello.o, which is the object file. Um, so when you type make, it'll try to build greet, and then it'll see that hello.o is out of, um, if it either hasn't been built or hello.c has changed, then make will figure out that it needs to rebuild hello.o before rebuilding the greet binary. Um, and that's how rules kind of work together to build up these really complex projects as your projects get bigger, which they do in a lot of 400 level classes. Um, however, you don't actually, make is smart enough to generate some rules automatically, and so rules for object files, .o files, can be built automatically so you don't actually have to explicitly spell those out, but that's how it works in the background. Um, then when you actually go to build your project, just type make, quick, reproducible, it's correct. And importantly, when you go back to your code, you know, two months later, you don't have to remember the exact build line, you just type make and then everything works, ideally. Um, but really, there's a lot of tools like make, um, not necessarily for building things, but that just reduce a complex process to a single command for you. Um, and these kinds of tools are really important because small distractions when you're developing a project can set you back a lot of time. You know, if you're trying to debug some really complex bug, you have all your program in your head and you think you're about to get it, 
but then you get distracted because you have to up arrow for a couple seconds or for you know like 10 seconds to get your build uh, line back and then you know if that was the wrong build line then you're further distracted by the time you actually run your program again uh, you like will have forgotten ex where you were and now you have to go back and takes you you know an extra 10 minutes to debug or an extra hour if you're unlucky um, and so tools like make help you when you say when you think I want to rebuild my project make and it's done um, and reducing, this is a common theme of tools and of good software development practices in general, reducing the time it takes to think about something and have it happen in the world is really important and will help you do all the important parts of development way faster um, and make as one of those systems. So here's another common occurrence. Uh, you run some binary and the only output you get is a seg fault. So this really sucks. And what a lot of people do, including myself for many years, is what's called printf debugging. I'm sure you guys know it. You go and sprinkle a bunch of printf lines saying this line was executed, this value is this, uh, just all throughout, your pro uh, all throughout your program, and you hope that you sprinkle enough printf statements around that when you rerun your program, you get print statements before and after the segfault line, and you can figure out, you can narrow in on what line this is happening and what values were in play when it happened. Again, we can see some problems with this. A, after you spend all the time putting these printf statements in, if you do track down the seg fault, you have to go spend time taking these printf statements out. Um, it's, the larger your project gets, the more difficult this gets. It's really error prone. Don't do this. There's this tool called the GNU debugger. And for the people of you using Macs like myself, it's called the LLVM debugger, LLDB instead of GDB. But this workflow I'm going to show you works exactly the same. Um, and what it does in general is you can attach to a running process and manipulate it. You can tell it when it needs to execute its next instructions. You can tell it to stop executing when certain conditions happen. You can inspect what values are on the stack, what the heap looks like, all these awesome things that give you a view of your program that you don't really get um, without a debugger. And so the one killer feature I want you guys to know, uh, first you compile with dash g to include debugging symbols in the binary, and then you just use gdb and the example binary here, so it's just gdb and then the program you want to run. Uh, it'll open up a GDB prompt. You just type run to start the process. The seg fault will happen, and then you just type backtrace, or BT. And this gives you a stack trace of exactly where the program was when the seg fault occurred and all the call frames above that. So I can see from this, this is one of, this was from my project in operating systems. There was a thread that got started, the like initialization stuff happened, and then in this routine, philo routine, it called this function dottle, and there was an, there was a error there. So it'll show you exactly what calls happened to get to a seg fault and exactly what line that seg fault occurred on. So stop printf debugging. GDB does tons of other stuff. Like I could, inst uh, and I used a lot of GDB's features for this project, like in stack, or inspecting the stack frame and keeping watches to tell me when certain variables changed and really invaluable tool. But the two commands, run and backtrace, can save you a ton of time. Uh, there's another great program that any, I assume a lot of people in here have taken 357, or at least all the sophomores from last year. Okay, well, one person has, come on guys, it's fine. So you learn about that in this class briefly, um, but it's really good before that as well. Whenever you're writing a C program, I highly recommend before you turn it in, you run it through Valgrind. Um, and, what, and it is pronounced Valgrind, by the way. It's a reference to the gates to Valhalla. It doesn't mean Valgrind. Um, so it's a memory error detector. Uh, which is the most kind of, or the most common kind of error in C programs. It's what's responsible for seg faults. It's what's responsible for a lot of logical errors with like arithmetic happening wrong. Really fun stuff. <clears throat> um, and all you have to do is whatever command you use to run your program, put Valgrim before it, and then it'll just it overrides the malloc calls and calloc calls and some other uh, library routines. And at the end, it gives you a memory report and tells you how much memory you lost and where that memory originated from. It also tells you bad memory accesses, which can help you track down bugs as well. Um, but most importantly, it tells you, like I said, if you leak some memory, it tells you the line that that allocation occurred on. Because just getting to the end of your program and having something say, you know, oh, you lost, you know, 4,000 bytes. It's like, great. No idea where that came from. Yes, Ryan? And this only works if the debugging stuff is within your binary? Ultimately, yes. Well, it overrides it like dynamically. Um, no, but like uh, where the line is, where allocation happens. Oh, yes. Okay. Always use dash t. 
Always use dash t. Def the final example. Definitely, definitely. OK, sorry. I thought you were alluding to like the open SSH problem that I talked about, or open SSL problem, where like they, over, they wrote their own allocation routines, which totally gets rid of the power of tools like this. You have a question? Okay. Also, guys, definitely interrupt me with questions if you have questions. Um, they had to inspect what goes on within libraries, except like if the library uses it above. That would need to be compiled with the dash g flag as well, correct? Well, they still work. It's just your output is less useful because instead of function names, you have function addresses, which aren't really apparent. But you could still use it to track down those errors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so I really got a lot of Algorand when I wrote a program for networks. Um, we had this big chat server, and we were losing a lot of memory. And I knew exactly where that memory was because it said, Right here in your packet allocation routine, some of this memory isn't getting freed, which helped me really easily track down what it was. And we were performing tons of allocations in that program. And so if I just had had some final number that's like, you're leaking memory, never would have found it. Uh, so Valgrid and GDB are another kind of tool that give you uh, a certain view that you wouldn't have otherwise. So you know, GDB helps you interact with processes in this, or introspect processes in a way that you can't really do by hand. Um, and Valgrim gives you a view of like your program's memory consumption that you wouldn't have without it. Uh, so these save a ton of time debugging. Seriously, use these tools. Um, they stop you from doing really error-prone stuff like printf debugging and uh, the strategy of memory management that is just hope. That doesn't pan out very well in the real world. And it helps you detect errors that you might not detect anyway or otherwise. Um, because a lot of errors in C tend to be latent and not show up until a long time down the line. And memory leaking is one of those. You know, it doesn't show up until you run out of memory. Um, but with tools like Valgrin, you can find it early. So this is another great kind of tool that you guys should definitely look into. And so uh, there's another kind of tool that people often overlook the importance of. Uh, the Unix philosophy is do one thing well. And then there's lots of tools for combining um, smaller utilities that work well together. So, First of all, man is short for manual, and it is the tool that you use to get information on other tools. And yes, you can do man, man, if you're curious. Um, and so the tools that I recommend everybody learn, um, not that I technically know all of them, but that I recommend all you guys learn, uh, tools like grep, which helps you, or which allows you to search through a bunch of files in a directory. Uh, I use this one a lot when browsing source code. I know there's some, a certain function call out there. You can find all the locations of it. Tools like sed that help you, that do like replacements. Find helps you find files. I'm sure you guys are familiar with cat. Uh, but definitely go through the slides of this program and then look over these utilities. Yes? Uh, Proto that be useful for finding like, the man page you're looking for? Hmm? A Proto? Mm. Uh, like you say, I don't know, a Proto is cat. And you say, oh, cat is easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. Or like where it can help you locate binaries as well. Um, but these utilities uh, become a lot more powerful when you start combining them together. And so I literally wrote this one last night uh, for a totally unrelated purpose to this talk. And what it does is it uses wgit, which downloads a web page, and then awk, which does some uh, string manipulation, and then this other tool, xargs, that I'll explain in a second. But so what this does is on a page where there's a bunch of download links, I needed to download all of them. Uh, and that's what the dollar sign one is. It's the first argument to this script. So it downloads the web page, and then there's this like till bar. Uh, if you guys are like, who here knows what the pipeline operator is in Unix? OK, that's a good amount. So what the pipeline operator does is it takes the output of one program and sends it to the next program. Um, so I say download this web page and then send it to awk. And what awk does is it takes a line. In HTML, when you have a link, you say href equals and then the link location. And so this script just uh, pulls out that link. So it downloads the HTML page, pulls out a link, and then sends all of those links to xarg. Um, and that runs a command for every single line. So for every one of those links, there's this command called Axel, which is an HTTP download accelerator. Uh, so it gets a page, gets all the links on the page, and then downloads all the links on the page. Um, kind of nefarious purposes, but really useful tool. Um, <laughs> Yes, except it doesn't do it recursively. Also, it uses Axel. I didn't want to use wget. wget's so freaking slow. Um, 
But one place where I worked without competitions to see like how long we can make these big Unix pipelines just at the command line and actually do something useful. And so I had like these crazy ones for like counting very specific or oddly specific things about files in a source directory and then ranking all the files in weird ways. And it was fun. Lots of, so definitely like learn these tools and then find weird ways to combine them on the command line. Um, and then when you do learn all these tools, you can start building shell scripts because Shell, uh, if you don't know this, your interactive shell can all, also has a non-interactive mode where you can just build up a big script and then have it all executed at once. And uh, it works very similar to how the interactive shell is, um, or how the interactive shell does. So move on to shell scripts once you know the utilities and you can build some fun stuff. Um, the thing that I end up writing shell scripts for most is executing a whole test suite for a program. Uh, and I've written like one of those scripts for like four or five of my projects throughout the years. I'll try not to take too long here. Uh, so uh, using shell scripts uh, is great for making little tools, but that becomes burdensome, burdensome really fast. I wouldn't recommend writing shell scripts that are over like 50 lines. Um, after that, just move to Python. And Python's great because you can just hack stuff out super quickly. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Could you comment on the difference between Python 2 and 3? No. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> They're incompatible with each other. That's true. It's terrible. For various dumb reasons. So, so I've written a lot of tools in Python. Uh, ones for, like I said, scoring board games, but I've used lots in class as well. And so when I took a distributed database class here, we created a database called CommieDB. Uh, because all the nodes were like the same. There was no master-slave architecture. It was like this homogenous node. Anyway, communism. Um, and distributed databases kind of present an interesting challenge when you're debugging them, because when you have a normal program, you can just put in a bunch of print statements or logging or whatever, and it's, or like just attach with the debugger. But all your state is contained in one process, give or take. But with um, a distributed database, you have multiple processes that are all intercommunicating. And to try and attach and get debug output that's useful, you know, if something goes wrong with this host and it's communicating in the wrong pattern to these hosts, it's really hard to tell. Uh, so um, our specific project, you had to have at least three processes. They all communicate. Really difficult to debug. So I made a script called local cluster. And so you'd run it with a configuration file, and it would launch, all, or launch enough processes to run the database locally. And then it would interleave the output from all those databases, the logging output. And then it would clean them all up once you're done debugging. And so the output for that looks like this. So the very first, or the first process is blue, the second one's this weird tail color, and the next one's um, yellow. So they all start up. And then you know, one process gets, I hope you can see this blue on the screen. Um, oh, sorry, guys. Well, it looks really good on my screen. <laughs> uh, the first one gets a request to store a value. It forwards it to the second node. The second node dispatches additional requests to the first and third node, uh, and then everything finishes. And so this made debugging way, way faster and way, way easier. Uh, the alternative would be having three different terminal tabs open, repeating the same command three times, and if I change it, changing it in all three places and making sure it's consistent, and then jumping back and forth and comparing these timestamps to figure out what order things happened in. And that'd be a huge nightmare if you're trying to like find some subtle bug and track how a uh, certain request makes progress through this distributed system. <clears throat> uh, I made another tool that did this on the real server as well, um, that put them actually on different physical hosts. And that was also a very useful tool. Um, and so the big picture of custom tooling is that you can make a tool that is exactly what you need it to be, which can be a huge, huge, huge benefit. Um, and so this, the cluster script probably took me half an hour to develop. And I estimate that it saved me at least like six hours in debugging, not to mention the rage of how tedious that kind of debugging would be without this kind of tool. Uh, so. Python's a great language. You guys should learn it if you don't know it. Um, and this is one of its many use cases. And just choose Python 2 or 3. It doesn't matter. Unless your employer uses one, then use that one. <laughs> but thank you, Ryan. Um, so kind of taking this philosophy of building your own tools to the logical extreme, uh, my two favorite examples, um, there's this database called FoundationDB. And Again, it's a distributed database, and the problems with distributed databases that I faced are the same ones they faced, just way, way harder, because you can have 
They had to account for network failures and hosts going down at random points and like user input coming in at different points. And so, you know, if you're simulating your database running, or like one way to tease out bugs is just push a bunch of requests to your database and see if it holds up. And so they create a simulation layer like that. But the problem is, if it fails, you have no idea what happened, and you can't recreate that state. Because if you just have like a randomly timed network outage or power outage, you know, how are you gonna recreate that in your test perfectly to like figure out where the bug happened? So they created this entire layer of software that would replace, that would simulate failures, it would simulate network errors, it would simulate all this stuff. Um, and it would allow you to tune exactly when it happened so that when you did have a failure, you knew exactly the state, the initial state of the database and when failures were gonna happen. Any non-deterministic behavior that could occur in the, when their database was running, they put into this layer and could control it. And so then they just create a bunch of random states, see if something failed, and if it did, then they just reset it and walk through and see exactly what happened. Um, which is totally an invaluable tool when you're building something like a distributed database. Um, but you know, when you have a custom tool that's this size, you have an entire team working on it. Uh, so this kind of, I'm gonna make myself better, a better software developer by developing software to help me develop software, it works if you take 20 minutes to learn a tool, and it works if you put an entire team of five devs working on the tool for two years. Uh, you can get a lot, a lot of mileage out of making tools. Um, there's another one that is from a paper that Google published on one of the distributed systems they made. Um, I was really into distributed systems for like a year, if you guys didn't notice. Um, and they uh, were building this uh, database by hand in C++ for a while, and then they decided to make a tool so they could express the algorithm really succinctly in like 70 lines or something, I think, right? Yeah, like 70 lines. And then they wrote a compiler for that language that targeted C++. Um, and then they had the simulation layer, again, on their cluster and simulated like hundreds of thousands of hours of this algorithm um, performing and seeing if it was doing the right thing in all the cases. Um, and they noticed a bug, like this bug that showed up a couple of times in those 100,000 hours of tests. And so they went back to their finite state machine um, expression of the algorithm that was 70 lines, changed a couple, of, or changed it in a couple places, or just one place, I think it was one place, and then recompiled it to the, C, uh, the giant C++ program, which is like 4,000 lines of this like, what? 7,000, whatever. 7,000 <laughs> lines of like this gross ass C++, and it changed in like a couple of places throughout that 7,000 7, or 7,000 lines, but just like random looking places. Um, and that ended up fixing the bug. But like fixing that bug by hand would have been a nightmare. Um, but they instead took all this time to develop a tool to help them go from a really clean definition to the C++ code that would be performing, and then it was way easier for them to make bugs. Um, and so one of the big takeaways from that last uh, tool specifically is that it might look like, okay, it'll take us this amount of time to sh uh, make the database, or, or sorry, the algorithm, to implement the algorithm just in C++, or it'll take us the same amount of time to make a tool that will implement that will help us implement it more quickly. Um, and the path where you just go for the direct implementation is awesome if you can do it perfectly the very first time. But as soon as you run into bugs, it's really nice to have these tools around and they can provide a really big return on investment. Um, yeah, have huge payoffs. Um, so what I encourage you guys to do, because obviously these like multi-year project tools aren't really a good scope to start with, is uh, in your workflow, just learn one tool at a time and then integrate it into how you develop. I'd recommend starting with Make because it's really simple, um, at least at first. <laughs> and then just, you know, so like, <laughs> it can, Make can become a really complicated tool. But you know, learn the basics of Make, uh, convert all of your like projects to use Make, so all you have to do is type Make and your whole project builds from scratch. And then, you know, you've now become much quicker to build your project. And once you have that down, you know, next time you, uh, uh, Get, see a segfault, like pull out GDB instead of just trying to print out debug it and see exactly where that segfault happened. And then, you know, if you have a more difficult project, learn a couple more features of, uh, of the GDB, of GDB. And then, you know, integrate tools one at a time and then be proactive about learning more about them on each one of your projects. And one of the big problems, and I totally get this because it happens to me all the time, is that tools have an upfront cost. And when you put off a project till right before it's due, you don't really have the time needed to pay that upfront cost. But as soon as you do, that tool will work for you for the rest of your career. So I'd highly recommend doing that and giving yourself enough time on projects to do that. Uh, also a good reason to learn them one by one. And then once you start figuring that kind of stuff out, 
once you start getting good at looking for inefficiencies in your own workflow, that's a great time to start making your own tools because you can build a tool that's useful to you. Uh, and developing for yourself is a lot of fun. I'd recommend you guys do that. Uh, so any immediate questions? Yes, Nick. So you talked about this a little bit in the talk, but I just wanted to, uh, do you have any tips on avoiding the situation of working on a tool so much that it actually becomes more of a hassle than whatever you're trying to solve? Like, how do you yes. avoid that? Yes, open source it, and then you'll feel good about it instead of like you just waste all, all that time. <laughs> so do it anyway. <laughs> I mean, the way to get around that is just have a very clear uh, goal of what you want your tool to be so you don't let feature explosion consume you. And then don't worry, like don't implement a tool in C unless you really have to. Like the great thing about tools is you can write them in Python. It can be slow code and you don't have to care because it's just a tool. It's not running in production. It's not running in a constrained environment. You know, all of our development machines are pretty good machines. So, you know, focus on a goal. Don't care about like performance. And also you don't have to care too much about writing good software. It's just gonna be like a quick one-off tool. And then if you do end up writing a really awesome tool, and you feel like you know it's going to waste, you could open source it or somehow share it with people and then you can feel better about the time you spent doing it. Yeah, anyone else with questions? Come on guys. Okay, well, if you have any questions in like the next day or month or like throughout the rest of your time at Cal Poly, feel free to ask me in some manner, Facebook, email, in person, in the White Hat Lab, whatever. The more creatively you can communicate, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> Carrier pigeon, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dude, that would be awesome. Good luck. Um, yeah, on like my Unix account. Uh, or like next time I talk to a professor, like, so this student wanted to know. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about like ways you can like improve your workflow or how a tool works in general, like I don't really want to answer questions that you could answer with a man page, but you know if it's like. Why does make work the way it does? Like, why are all these weird design decisions this way? You know, I'd love to answer those kinds of questions. If you want, like, good tutorials or references, whatever, ask me questions about tools. Anyway, so that's what I have for you guys. Thanks for listening.